This is Six Tackles with Gus with Matthew Thompson and Gus Gould. Gus Gould. Hello, welcome to Six Tackles with Gus for this week ahead of an Origin Decider. In just seven days' time as we record the podcast today, we've got an abbreviated Round 17 coming up as well, only four games because of uh, half the competition being allowed to buy with Origin. Uh, the NRL's going to the pub. I'm going to talk to Gus about that. Got a heap of great Ask Gus questions. A Kiwi theme to Six Tackle Trivia, and we'll have a look at those games as well. How are you, Gus? I'm good, thanks, Matthew. How are you? I'm good. I cut myself shaving badly this morning. Have you got any... What do you do? How do you stop the blood? Oh, it'll, it'll stop eventually. If not, we'll find another commentator. Don't yeah. panic. A blood transfusion for me is... Could, could you help me with that? I actually, I actually cut I myself. That. I actually cut myself shaving badly the night before my last ever coaching gig. Mm. My last ever coaching gig was the Origin Three in two thousand and four, mm. and the night before, I usually take the staff out for a few drinks, and we had a we had a couple of pre dinner drinks, and I went up to have a shave so we could go out and have a good night together, and I cut all my chin. I remember it. What, what were you shaving with? Alex? Well, I I asked the hotel if they could send up some oh. shaving gear because I'd lost my shaving gear and they sent up one of them plastic kit things. Oh, they're terrible, aren't they? And I'd had a couple of beers and I just <laughs> oh, I, I, I ripped half my chin off. <laughs> so I spent the rest of the night with a tissue trying to hold the blood from my chin and then... Look like Norman Gunston. We won the Origin the next night and had all the photos of all this gouge <laughs> taken out of my chin. They thought I'd been hit at training or something. Someone those hotels should not, the be, they should not be allowed to give you those those razors. They are, uh, they're an OH&S. Some of the things disaster. you ask you for and some of the things they send up to you are just dude. What about the toothbrushes? You clean your shoes with them. Not in the same postcode. Mm. Gus, finals fever. Now, you, you, you generally think you get you get after origin and you're on the downward run, aren't you? Is that your theory? Well, no, you're not on the downward run yet. Aren't you? When are you, when no, you used, on the downward run? We used run? to see it as, after that was base camp, the summit is the grand final. You're going uphill now. Up to the finals. The I games mean. get harder, the opposition gets better, the games mean more. And the results, are, uh, you know, they mean more. Mm. You know, we used to call it base camp. We'd get to mm. the end of the finals and we'd set up a little thing on the wall in the gym. We're at base camp. This is where we are. And every step along the way was another trip up the mountain towards the summit. Mm. Just a little visual exercise for the players and let them know that everything we do for the rest of the season is just going to get harder, tougher. The opposition will get better. And there's a greater stake at all the games. I like that. Very nice. Where did you say we're going downhill? If you're going well, downhill at this time, mate, you're in real finals, trouble. You are, you are in real trouble. Not going to make it. Although, although the Panthers are on autopilot, they're cruising. Mm. They've got a differential of 306 positive. It's pretty amazing. 15 wins, one loss. But I want to talk to you about the congestion around the eight. Now, um, 18 points, Dragons in eighth. Yep. Rabbitohs, 18 points, seventh. Then you've got Parramatta Paramat- on the weekend, losing another one they shouldn't have lost. They're on 20, as are the Broncos. But the chasing pack, Manly 16 on 9th. Roost, I can't believe the Roosters are in 10th. They're on 14 points. The Raiders also on 14 points. They might have got dudded on the weekend. And look, there's a couple of games in there they should have won as well. Um, are you, I'm drawing the line at 14 points. I don't think anything less than 14 can make it, do you, at this stage? No. No, no look, I, I wouldn't think... You know, I think 14 would be, be hopeful, uh, Raiders or Roosters. You've got to remember some of these top teams, you know, at the start of the year we talk about the top sides and Roosters are amongst them. They do the draw so that all the top teams play each other, you know, for crowds and broadcast rights and gates. and you know, So the draw is not even. It's not until we get to deeper in the season that things start to sort themselves out a little bit. So, um, you know, the Roosters have been playing top-class opposition pretty much most of the year. I still think they'll they'll qualify for the eight, judging by their performance the other yeah. night. In, in losing to the Panthers the other night, they would have beaten every other team in the competition mm, on that performance. Great. And I think it was the same the loss the week before. Um, they'd have beaten any other team in the competition, but uh, Panthers just going too good for them at the moment. But because the other variable is that neither Manly Roosters or Raiders in ninth, tenth, and eleventh have had a buy yet. Yeah, well, you've got to factor that in as well. So. If you if you add two points on to Manly, they're in eighth. Just look at the number of wins, Matthew. It's a very simple equation. Yeah, math isn't my strong point. 
So um, w my question to you is, are you prepared to make a call about who you think may or may not make it at this stage? Uh, no. Okay. No. I, I think both Rabbitohs and Dragons, I think the top six are sweet. I don't think I don't think one of those will drop out of the eight. Rabbitohs and Dragons are most vulnerable, but they're probably going better than the others anyway, so um, I, I can't see too much change. Normally at this time of year, you might get a team. You know, traditionally, we've always said teams make a deep run from back in the pack. You know, they'll be down and out early, and then they'll make a deep run late in the season and come storming home to, to get into seventh or eighth position. But we don't see much of that in recent years. You know, once the, the top eight sort of decided, it stays there, doesn't it? Um, so the Roosters are the team that can make the run. On their well, Roosters are the thereabouts, aren't they? You know, so uh, you know they're they're a top eight side for mine. Um, Rabbitohs and Dragons have got to find that consistency. Dragons have had a fairly comfortable draw in recent times. Um, it'll just come down to who you play. Hmm. So uh, HWS has asked you a question on Ask Gus, big Nova Castrian fan here. Is there a chance for a late season ambush for us Knights fans? The rest of our draw is not too bad. I still understand. Um, I don't understand what that means. Um, I think he's saying that their mentality hasn't been great so far. But if can they make a run towards the finals, Newcastle? Yeah, look, they haven't had a, a great le a deal of luck with injuries. They've really had their top side on the field. Um, a big one this week against the South Sydney Rabbitohs. Then they've got Manly, so they're playing teams just in front of them. They play the Roosters, so that's their next three weeks may determine their fate mm. because they've got. Um, Rabbitohs, Manly and Roosters three weeks in a row. After that, they've got Bulldogs, Tigers, Broncos, Raiders, Titans, Sharks. I mean, it's not the ugliest draw you've ever seen in your life. So their fate could well be sealed in the next three weeks if suddenly they found mid-season form and their last performance was pretty good. Like their wingers come up with, what, eight tries between them or something. Yeah. Um, and they can get their all their players on the field. Depends how Ponga comes out of the origin, I guess. But you know, South Manly and Roosters the next three weeks will probably seal their fate one way or the other. Mm. Yes, and when you're competing against teams uh, that you're you're vying for finals spots with, taking two points off them is is obviously well, they're very big, crucial. They're big results. You, you look at Roosters too. Like you know, Roosters have had a I think a tough draw, but. Um, they've now got Dragons, which, you know, they lost that game on Anzac Day earlier this year to the Dragons. They then got Knights, they then got Manly, then got Broncos, then got Cowboys, then got Tigers, Storm, Rabbitohs. So it's it's not an easy draw, and it's, it's not, you know, yeah. there's a couple in there that can win, so they've still got some work to do. Dragons. Uh, Big game this Sunday. They've got Brisbane with all the origin blokes here and a, a host well, of injuries got, as well. They've got Broncos at their mercy this week, and then they play Roosters, and they play Manly, and they play Cowboys, and oh, they play Sharks, and they tough. play Raiders, then they play Titans and Tigers and Broncos again. So That's tough, isn't it? Yeah, but there's three or four wins in there for them, which might be enough to get them home. If you keep going at 50%, you're probably going to, probably going to qualify. Sea Eagles... Uh, well, they're up and down, aren't they? Uh, they've got Knights, they've got Dragons, they've got Roosters, they've got Eels, they've got Titans, they've got Sharks, they've got Raiders, they've got Bulldogs. Mm. So, again, you, it's not, you'd it's give not them an 50, run. You'd give them 50%, wouldn't you? Rabbitohs are the interesting ones because I can't work out whether they're in form or not in form. I can't work out whether they're going good or they're not going good. It confuses me, the Rabbitohs. They've got Knights, Bulldogs, Storm, Sharks, Warriors, Eels, Panthers, Cowboys, Roosters. Mm. They've got a tough draw. Mm. They've got a tough draw. And, you know, I know they've got Latrell Mitchell back now, but they're going to have to find a little bit better and a little bit better consistency to what they've shown. Can you entertain me with one? Can you have a look at Parramatta? Eels. Mm. Eels are always entertaining, doesn't matter what it looks like. So, Eel. Eel plays Tiger, then Warrior, then Bronco, then Panther, then Manly, then Rabbit, mm. then Bulldog, then Bronco, then Storm. There's a few toughies there. Well, again, you give them 50%, it's probably <laughs> enough to get them in. I don't. I, none of these teams have got a draw where I say they're going to win six or seven of their last eight. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Let's have a look at the Panther just for interest. They'll win eight out of eight. They've got Tiger, Shark, Eel, Raider, Storm, Rabbit, Warrior, Cowboy. Mm. They might rest some players at some stage then. How are the Cowboys looking? Let's have a look at what they've got. Cowboys got Shark, Tiger, Dragon, Bulldog, Rooster, Warrior, Rabbit, Panther. Now, Cowboys could win five or six out of eight easily. Lock them in, Eddie. They're a lock. They're in the top four. They might finish second. They are a lock. Storm, do you think they're getting the staggers a little bit? They've got Shark without their rep players. I think Shark will beat them tomorrow night. Yeah. Uh, Raider, Rabbit, Warrior, Titan, Panther, Bronco, Rooster, Eel. Mm. The last three weeks isn't easy. Mm-hmm. But uh, they're in the finals. There's a lot to play finish. out yet. There's a lot to play out. Bronco? Yet. Bronco. Oh, he's got me. Bronco. Bronco. They've got Dragon, Titan, Eel, Tiger, Rooster, Knight, Storm, Eel, Dragon. Lock him in, Eddie. Lock him in. Give him 50-50. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, so what's the it, it, it'll it'll the it'll, it'll be up to Rooster or Sea Eagle to try and okay. overtake a dragon or a rabbit. I think. She's the Raiders. I mean, they they have they have blown this season up, haven't they? Like I know, it's I not know uncommon for them. They they seem to have a season like this every year. Oh, don't they? I mean, against the Broncos a couple of weeks back, like they had they had a hundred chances to win that game and couldn't couldn't score the try that they needed. Uh, and obviously, the NRL has come out and admitted that everyone, what everyone knows, that it should have been a penalty in front of the sticks the other day. Uh, but again, in the second half, with with the benefit of that huge breeze behind them, they 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 didn't they didn't play uh, in a manner that suggests they deserved to win that game. Like they had the game, they had that game at their mercy. They got back to twelve ten with twenty more than twenty five minutes to go, and I looked at the clock and I looked at the win and I said, well, they should just grind home and win here. Yeah. All they've got to do is kick the ball. And they didn't. They never got out of their own half for the last 25 minutes. I know. They only got up there the last couple of minutes. And the Dragons just totally dominated them, even though they ran into a, a gale down there. They just, they just couldn't get themselves into the contest. It was... Um, no, they didn't help themselves at all. Uh, you know, it's, they, had, they had two occasions where they conceded points with their own line dropouts because they didn't kick at 10 metres. And they had two occasions where they won scrums within 30 metres of the opposition line and dropped it on tackle zero. Yeah. Then they had a penalty coming out of trouble where they did fail to find touch. So at the end of the game, you know, having a complaint about the penalty that they shouldn't have got, mm. or they should have got, and we know they should have got it, but um, they kind of done it to themselves prior to that. Yep. And the Dragons found a way to graft out a tough win. They got their points early. Um, remember, the Dragons scored off a line dropout that freakish one where Jack White and yep. tapped the ball back. And the other one was right before the stroke of half time where Moses Suley dived over. They never really looked like troubling the scorer after that. So they scored two pretty innocuous tries, but it was enough to get them home. Yep. All right. Uh, so Gus is saying top 10 shooting for eight spots. That's, well, that's the upshot of that. That's what, that's what you reckon, having had a look through. I can see 15 right teams now. playing off a second. I can't see that this competition isn't over. Mm. Okay. It's over by a long way. Touch wood. Um, interesting news with Reese Walsh heading to the Broncos next year. Now, when you were associated with the Warriors, you were instrumental in his move to the uh, to the New Zealand club. He was playing lower grades with the Broncos, but on compassionate grounds, he's being uh, he's being allowed a release to go back to Queensland. Chance Nickel Klustar will head from from Canberra back to the Warriors. Um, but they're not letting they're not letting him talk to the Dolphins. It's only Brisbane. Yeah. So um, look, I haven't got all the facts, and I haven't spoken to anyone at the Warriors about this. But <clears throat> what I do know is that Reese Walsh was very, very committed to the to the Warriors' cause, and he was very committed to going back to New Zealand. However, there's been a significant change in his own personal circumstances, um, and there is a desire for him to stay close to Brisbane, to be close to. Um, uh, child and the Warriors understand this on compassionate grounds. Uh, the fact that they've gone off and signed um, their former fullback from uh, the Raiders would indicate that they're they're you know resigned to the fact that he he is going to stay in Brisbane. 
but they've only asked that he negotiate with uh, the Broncos rather than the Dolphins, the new setup over there. Now, you would have to ask them as to the reason behind that. I can speculate, but I won't. Um, but um, I understand the Dolphins have actually complained to the NRL today that um, that they shouldn't be able to restrict with, with whom he negotiates uh, if he's going to leave the Warriors. Yeah, There's been no definitive statement that he is leaving the Warriors, although it's expected that's what will happen, and I'm sure that the Warriors will be looking after his personal situation, whatever that is, whatever's changed there. Um, as I say, I won't speculate or comment on, comment on that, but he's a terrific young kid, Rhys Walsh. He wouldn't be doing anything mischievous or underhanded. He wouldn't be doing disloyal at any stage. He was, you know, was always touted as a player that, um, you know, having left the Broncos, you know, eventually he would gravitate back to them and he, he always denied it and said no, he was very committed to the Warriors' cause and he, he's a great kid, terrific kid and a brilliant young player. Uh, it's a boost for the for the Broncos if they are to, able to pick him up but of course it it will place some some strain on their already strained salary cap and and depth chart up there because they've got a number of players who can play several positions and, and they'll be working out what their halves look like into the future and what their fullback looks like. They've certainly got Selwyn Cobbo there, who's been groomed as a fullback of the future, and yeah. perhaps Rhys Walsh ends up being a, a number six. It's sort of he's touted to be taking that Darren Lockyer route. But Darren Lockyer played fullback until he was 26, 27 before he made the conversion. Rhys is still a young man. Um, young Ezra, I think they see as a half of the future, but Adam Reynolds is there at the moment, and he's got a mortgage on that spot, so... It could mean that they've, there's got to be some movement in the Broncos or from the Broncos uh, to accommodate a Reese Walsh back in their salary cap. Uh, Herbie Farnsworth, I thought, had committed to the Broncos, but I'm now hearing could well be headed towards the Dolphins himself. Oh, I thought he'd signed. Uh, yeah, I thought he'd signed, but you know, that's the scuttle going around. So, Anyway, I know better than to speculate about rumours. I don't deal in rumours. I don't deal in people coming up with scenarios around who's signing and who's not signing. So, Any other scuttlebutt? What I've got plenty of scuttlebutt. I can give you all the rumours you like. How Come many rumours do you want? I don't, do you I don't deal in rumours. I'd love to hear I don't deal in rumours. I'm batting back rumours all the time. You just, you just make it up, the media. You just make it up. Vultures. I think what you do is you make it up so you get a, so you get a, a denial. Then the denial becomes the story. Mm. And then you just tick off all the denials until you get closer and closer to maybe the, mm. the truth. Yeah. And when you say nothing's happening, then no one believes you. Because there's always something happening with Gussie. No, there's not. Nothing's happening. <laughs> nothing's happening. <laughs> nothing's happening. No, the, the seas are calm. Yeah. The water is still. What does Luttrell coming back do to Souths? Gee, I mean, it didn't take him long, did it? He looked fit. He looked strong. Yeah, he looked good. He looked good. Um, you know, I think it was a very wise and mature decision for him to stand down from the origin. I don't think he's had the preparation necessary to go into the boiler room of that uh, of that brand of football, and he knew that. And you know, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to be just getting around in your club mats there, playing in the wet like he did the other night, and have a nice little settle back into the game. But it's obviously he's got those touches of class and that brilliance to make things happen on his own. I think it'll be a a nice uh, a nice thing for Damian Cook and Cody Walker to have him there now, and knowing that they've got that option out the back. And uh, it, South Sydney need him. They haven't been anywhere near consistent enough week in week out mind you they're good is very good that's the thing about them that's what confuses you because when they're actually on um, their attacking game can be as lethal as anyone and they can they can post up some really resilient defense at times but it hasn't been there all season at all they've had some really terrible halves of football uh, which sort of you know when you when a side is up and down like that you start questioning just exactly what's going on there but if they can find consistency over the last couple of months uh, Latrell Mitchell will be a big factor for them. Um, it was a big step for him to go overseas and have that uh, uh, that treatment that he had. There's a little bit of conjecture about exactly what he had treated over there, uh, but whatever it is, it's got him back running freely, which is is important. And uh, he looked good the other night, um, and he looked all smiles, which was important. Yeah. Uh, when he's got a smile on his face, he tends to play better. And uh, he'd be a big asset to any team. There's no no risk about that. And you're right. He did look fit. He didn't. He looked he looked really mobile and free in his action. And he wasn't all perfect. He was a little bit of rust there. But uh, when it come down to running over people, he doesn't have any trouble doing that. No. Well, if he's still rusty, um, when he gets uh, fully 
lubricated. And yeah, well, take him. You know, he'll, you know, he'll be second up this week. They say with race horses, second up is the hard run. You know, after they've had a spell, so he's had a spell. See how he how he fares this weekend. So, Gus, um, the NRL is looking to invest to, uh, like anyone, I suppose, invest their money, try and try and make their money work for them. And their first venture is to buy the um, Gambaros up there at, near uh, near Suncourt, where a lot of people, uh, big for functions, if a lot of people listening to us probably been to Gambaros for a lunch before you head to a game or something like that. Um, so the NRL is investing in pubs and restaurants now. I'm wondering, hypothetical. Oh, we don't deal in hypotheticals. Let's have, let's have it. Let's play a game. If they're going to redecorate it, what, what do you reckon it look like? What's the NRL game bar is going to look like? <laughs> well, I, don't it? Think, I don't think they'll be changing anything too much up there. It's uh, it's one of the iconic um, meeting and restaurant places in Brisbane and has been for a long time. Um, and uh, I don't know. I, look, I know that Peter Volandis, when he got onto the commission with the with the National Rugby League, was astonished at the lack of assets on the balance sheet for a, for a game that had, had, had created so much revenue over a long period of time uh, with all the billions of dollars that have gone through the hands of the managements down there had nothing to show for it on the balance sheet, no assets whatsoever. Uh, not even their own building at NRL Central. It was eventually built on uh, Sydney Sydney Cricket Ground Trust land. There was nothing, you know, when when you compare that to the AFL and um, what they had invested in and the assets that they had uh, around the money that they'd earned over the years, uh, the NRL had virtually lived paycheck to paycheck from broadcast rights deal to broadcast rights deal and right. um, had never never at any time either looked or, or actioned gaining assets that were revenue raising or that would give the the game um, you know an asset base going forward so peter volandis who's done a wonderful job with new south wales racing and is, is certainly um, when you look at the ownership of that organization and all the country racetracks that he's gone out and bought and um, they've got a, a large asset base um, he's going to be building new training centers and doing all the likes so he was sort of astonished as to why the NRL hadn't gone down that line. Having said that, uh, moving into a restaurant hotel in, of this magnitude, like $30 million, I think that's a, a rather small purchase. Um, and I, I don't quite understand it. He'll have his reasons, I guess. Um, I mean, it is an iconic venue and there is a, a new hotel uh, facility there, but um, I would have... I would have thought that perhaps the idea of you know perhaps being involved in stadia um, or commercial properties uh, larger than that commercial property where they would house their own uh, administrations those sort of things would have been more in keeping with what they'd have suspected. Uh, I remember years ago Nick Politis was trying to get the league to buy uh, the whole grounds there around the showground in Fox Studios, um, which was uh, available to them, and he, he he touted that as a really big asset that the NRL could own and, and utilise and, and make a home out of, but um, that sort of fell through because they didn't have the money, obviously. Mm. They'd spent it all. Um, so you'd really have to ask Peter Volandis. I, I can't imagine that anyone else has made this decision other than him. Well, no one could make the decision other than him, and I wonder what it is he saw in you know, the restaurant and hotel there in Caxton Street as a must-have asset for the NRL and what he what he thinks the NRL earns out of that or whether that then in time gives them the capacity to to borrow or I don't know. I don't know I don't know enough about that. I'm not an asset builder, Matt. Are you an asset oh, yeah. builder? No. <laughs> yeah, right. I was put on this earth to spend money. I don't I don't make money. Anyway, I don't want to look. so I've never wait. tried to make money. I don't I never give it one minute's thought of any day. Well about you've got as much as you have, you don't have to making money. Um, so what's on the menu? What's the PVL? What do you reckon the PVL would be? If you order the PVL, what would come out? The PVL? Yeah. The um, Gambaros, what would you get? It would be something Greek. Yeah. It would be something Greek. Lovely slow-cooked lamb. Yeah. I've, I've got to say, it's one of my favourite restaurants. I used to love going there. and Seafood, isn't it? Yeah, seafood. Yeah. We had some wonderful times there. Um, as I said, when I used to coach the Origin teams, the the last night before the game, every every game, so three times a year, I would take our staff out for dinner the night before the game, and we, we became a real family, a lot of the, the staffs that we had there around the origin, and we had some wonderful nights together um, um, socially. It was a, a great experience being in origin with all those people, and 
Uh, they've all remained lifelong friends out of it, but um, uh, Gambaros was, was a favourite when our origins were up in Queensland. We, uh, we'd go to Brisbane, we'd go to Gambaros the night before the game. Go seafood platter? Oh, seafood, everything. Yeah, yeah, platters and whatever you needed. Yeah. What do you like? And then we go across the road to the Caxton, which oh, people yes. would think would be rather dangerous for an Origin coach, the New South Wales coach, to head over to the Caxton. But I never had any problem. Did you have any problems when you drove down Caxton Street the night after? No, never, never. What? No, well, they stopped us doing it. We only, I, we, we did it twice back in the early nineties. We went down Caxton Street, and that was quite an experience. I mean, they nearly tipped the bus over twice, and then. The police escort wouldn't take us that way anymore. They'd take us another way. So, and it was pretty dangerous because people had run out on the streets and, yeah, yeah. you know, Queenslanders and beer. You know, they just don't. They can't work it out. I know it's not even full strength. Yeah. Oh, well, you didn't. You didn't like the, the menu for the Gambaros. What about the Gus? What would the Gus Gould be? What's that? What, 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 if we were going to order the Gus at Gambaros, what would we get? Um, I'm not actually a big seafood person. I've got to be honest. But you know, I, I like I like I like my prawns. You'd be a steak. You'd be. You might be a surf and turf. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes. What would I have? I don't mind a little bit of John Dory, I suppose. If I go, if I go to a seafood restaurant, I will eat fish. I will eat right, fish. So it's a fish I won't. Dish. The gas. The gas yeah, is a fish. But dish. it's very simple. Simple. Yeah. I've got to be honest. If I go there, I'm there for the alcohol. I'm not necessarily <laughs> there for the food. <laughs> what about the Gus cocktail? That's what we're after. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. good. Um, all right. A couple of ask us questions on the club front. Then I'm going to do the trivia. Then we're going to talk about origin. Ashley Evans asks, and I'm going to dangerous ground here, but we'll we'll try not to we'll try not to go too long. Is there a need to review the seven tackle rule? I think any kick from inside the ten or twenty metre line that goes dead shouldn't result in seven tackles to the defending team. The rule was brought in to stop longer kicks purposely being kicked dead. Now that you've been saying that the the shorter kicks are the ones that are unfair, like that just sort of bobble over the back. Would you be happy with that if they were to make a slight amendment? I don't see any. I don't see any need for a seven tackle set in our game at any time. I've never been a fan of it. I've never been a fan of the zero tackle. That's not our game. That's not what it's supposed to be. But it was brought in by people who got frustrated with certain parts of the game, and this whole seven tackle set, the ball being kicked dead from the twenty metre zone, was in in. Knee-jerk reaction to a couple of tactics where teams wouldn't kick to a certain fullback; they'd rather kick it dead and have you start, you know, from the from the 20 metre zone rather than risking the fullback running it back 40 or 50, which only lasted a few weeks. But you know, certain coaches in this game seize upon opportunities to get the game the way that they want it and shape the way that they want it. There are certain, there have been a couple of coaches over the years that have been really um, you know, proactive in this regard. So what they did was they said, well, if you kick it dead from a from a kick, it's a it's a seven tackle set from the twenty meter zone. But then every twenty meter tap became a seven tackle set from the twenty meter zone. Whether you missed a field goal, whether you dropped the ball over the try line, yeah, you know, that, that's all ridiculous. They don't deserve seven tackles from that. A grubber kick that just fumbles over the dead ball line, people challenging, or the players knock the ball on dead in goal. You don't deserve seven tackles for that and twenty meters. You don't deserve territory. And yeah. seven tackles for all of that. You miss a field goal. So, and, and this is another example of half doing a rule and not understanding the ramifications of it and then leaving it up to the referees to determine. That same thing happened with our stripping rule. Same, oh, don't start me. No, anymore. well, I won't. But, I, but that, that was a question from one of our... I don't listeners. see any reason for a zero tackle or seven tackles in our game at any instance. At any instance. Never. Mm-hmm. Never. You know, but back in the day, you know, you, some of our coaches were very pedantic about it, what they wanted, what they wanted the game to look like, and what suited their team. And that's what coaches do. They they look at rules at how it suits their team and their personnel at the time, and it suited them to have that five meters to ten meters. You know, okay. I go through the whole history of it. I see no reason for a seven tackle set in a six tackle game. Why do we do it? Thank you for your question, Ashley Evans. If you'd like to ask Gus one, you can ask Gus. On social media, we'll send the uh, call to action out Mondays on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook, and you can send it through. Okay, six tackle trivia. Sean Johnson became the fourth greatest point scorer for a New Zealand player in the Premiership at the weekend. Can you name the three ahead of him? Sean Johnson became the fourth greatest point scorer for a Kiwi player in the Premiership at the weekend. Can you name the three that sit ahead of him? We'll uh, see whether Gus can work that out right after this.
Sean Johnson, 1,200 points he knocked up at the weekend. He's got three ahead of him in terms of most points for New Zealand players in the Premiership. Mm-hmm. Can you name the three? Well, I'd say Matthew Ridge would have to be one of them. He is. Daryl Halligan would have to be one of them. He is. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of another Kiwi goal kicker. Daryl Halligan, 2,034. Matthew Ridge, 1,331. Mm. This next person has 1,232. 1,232. I don't, I, think, I don't think Stacey Jones kicked enough goals. This bloke was only a part-time goal kicker? Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. Um, I'll bet it's something obscure too. Nope. Isn't it? It's a prominent, isn't it? Let me think. Kiwi, did he play with the Warriors? Nope. No, that's what I thought. Um, Kiwi, point scoring... No. Let me just see if I could offer you uh, a little bit more here. Oh, he kicked 402 goal. Oh, no, he didn't. Well, he would have had to. He scored 1,200 points. 402 goals. Matthew Ridge. 416 goals in his first grade career. Matthew Ridge, Daryl Halligan. What era? To boot in 2002, retired last year. Wow. I should know that then. To boot in 2002, retired last year. 416 goals. I didn't. I didn't. Didn't even think that Kiwi who retired last year. No, I've got brain fog. He's, he's he's debatably New Zealand's best ever player, Gus. Really? <laughs> Come on, Benji Marshall. Correct. Correct. Four hundred and two. Four hundred and sixteen goals in first grade. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because so, he went in and out a little while there, and he yeah he kicked a little bit early, then he kicked a little bit late. I don't remember him taking too many shots at goal. He only had 416 goals. Yeah. How many tries did he score? 96. Mm. 76 for the Tigers, 8 for the Dragons. I was an, I was an unabashed Benji Marshall fan. Oh. Always always have been. From the first time I ever saw him play. I saw him play as a schoolboy. Mm. saw him play, first play as a schoolboy. He was playing in a schoolboy game. Remember when we used to have the schoolboy cup games on before the... Mm-hmm. We used to broadcast them before the Friday night football and replay them on the Saturday morning. Yep. You get up Saturday morning, watch the schoolboys. And I was actually on a plane going up to Queensland with Andrew Voss, our former commentator, and he said, have you seen much of this Benji Marshall? I said, I haven't seen him. I've heard of him. Mm-hmm. I've heard a little bit about him. And uh, in the first three or four minutes of play, someone threw him a ball about 20 metres out from his own line and he put together a left foot and a right foot step that just left them stranded. And he raced 70 metres and scored in the corner. And I hate putting labels on young players, and you know, particularly schoolboys. And I said, I haven't seen a step like that since Brad Fittler. Uh-huh. And I really wanted to swallow the word straight away because I didn't want anyone to ever make... compare. I hate comparing kids to, to great players, you know. But it didn't hold him back, did it? Uh, he was a sensation. Within a couple of years, he... He came in and reignited the West Tigers, and they went on to win a premiership in 2005. But I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that moment. I'll never forget mm. that first time I saw him with the ball in his hands and what he did. Yep. And he just did it. In, he was doing it in the NRL within months. You know. Well, the way he evolved his game too over the years, like he became a became a mature game manager towards the end of his career, and was playing great football. The last couple of years, he played as, as good at probably any time in his career. The great Benji Marshall. So there you go. They're the top four Kiwi point scorers. Origin three coming up. Jordan McLean to Dubu. I think he's the going to be the fifth oldest New South Wales first gamer. My question to you, Phil Gould, is what's up with Regan Campbell-Gillard? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I can't. I haven't asked and no one's offered an explanation for that or as to why... Uh, Regan Campbell-Gillard missed selection in Game 2, let alone Game 3, now that they've gone back to another front rower. I know that um, Jordan was a part of the squad, and Brad Fittler's been keen to get him involved. Um, looking back at players that have debo- debuted so late in their career, they haven't had, I think, a great record, nor have they played many more after they've had that debut at that time. But I think Brad Fittler is looking at winning form in clubs, looking at the reasons why those clubs are winning. And we say this to players all the time. You know, if the team wins, selectors will look at individual performers and contributors. And 
if we look at the Cowboys and their improvement this year and where they are on the premiership ladder, then you go to their team and you say, all right, what are the, what are the things that they're getting right? And one of the things they're getting right is that they advance the ball. They, make, they, they get the ball to go forward. They defend very well around the, the play the ball area, which is really important. And Jordan McLean has, has done his work there. Uh, he's a player that, that left the Melbourne Storm system probably at the height of his career, went to the Cowboys. They've struggled in, in times and maybe he's struggled along with them. But he's persevered with his football, and now he's playing really good football at this stage of his career. The, the the advance from NRL to Origin at that age, though, has caught out players similarly of similar age debuting at this time. There have been a couple that I remember distinctly that debuted late in their career, and probably Origin shocked them a little bit you know, because they've got into a rhythm with their football over a long period of time. and. It's, it's hard to explain to people the difference between NRL and, and, and Origin pace at different times, but he's a very mature player, a very steady player. The, his game is uncomplicated. There is nothing that, that he probably can't affect to get the job done. And there is obviously something about Regan Campbell-Gillard um, that just had the selectors and Brad Fittler thinking they needed to look in another direction. I personally don't see it. I, think I see Regan Campbell-Gillard as a a real asset. I see him as one of the top front rowers in the game, simply because of his output of work and the fact that he can do it consistently for 80 minutes if he had to, which I think is a real asset in in, in big time football, finals football and origin football. Regan Campbell Gillard can go for three days and, and not change his stride. Um, he's a very athletic sort of player, but uh, there was obviously something that Brad Fittler saw that he either didn't like or he liked about Jordan McLean, plus this idea of rewarding consistent club form and, and holding everyone up to the mark. So Parramatta have had their dodgy little ones as well. Um, you know, whether Regan came out of origin and didn't play well enough for his club the next weekend, they, they look at all sorts of things around character and body, you know, body language and performance. And one of the things we say about origin players is, um, you know, the origin player goes back and plays well for his club the next week and backs up and does it. And the, these are the little challenges we set them. And, you know, somewhere along the line, Regan's obviously come up short of the mark in Brad Fittler's eyes and mm. Jordan McLean hasn't. So Jordan gets the nod this week and we wish him well. I, his game is uncomplicated. I do you don't, think that's why, do you think that's the attraction? That he's just an uncomplicated, well, I, toiling I, front row? Well, it, you know, it's hard to pick a player at this age on debut if he's going to need a lot of things in his favour to get his job done. You know, if he's going to need, mm. you know, like, what you want is someone who can just come in and do his job and not be complicated by what everyone else is doing and, and they've got a simple task for him. You know, it's it's interesting too because they've only really got the um, Junior Bolo on the bench. They've only really got the one big front rower on the bench. Mm. So by the time they get to, to game three in these series now, they tend to go with more mobile back rowers who can fill in in the middle of the field uh, rather than the traditional two big front rowers on the bench and, and looking for big men rotating throughout the game. So um, I just, I, you know... I have my own opinion on that, but that seems to be the modern way of doing things. And I suppose Ken Murray it'll is all a play out. player, largely, isn't he? Being used on an edge. Cameron Murray, well, yeah. he's a lock forward. Yeah. He's not what no, we call a prop. front rower, yeah. but they tend to go with this. This is the mobile thing that they're looking for. They're looking for you know, incisive runs, quick play the balls, you know, athleticism out of marker, you know, chasing down field goal attempts or chasing down kick, kickers and putting mm. pressure on kickers or support play or getting a quick play of the ball so your halves can get a roll on, um, you know, creating space for Damien Cook to run from dummy half so they get, you know, they get um, uh, Coruscant out there early and as they did in game two, then Damien Cook comes on. Well, Cameron Murray can come to the middle and create, you know, and that's I, I think that's why Sifa Talakai has probably got the nod in front of Jack Whiten, because Sifa Talakai has got that low-to-the-ground stepping, um, um, bullocking-type style of run where he can create a, a missed tackle or he can create a quick play of the ball or he can create an offload or a half-break that then allows, you know, Crichton and Cleary and Luai to come in, chime in over the back of it, Tedesco to support through the middle of the field. So they're the little moments you're looking for in origin. It's, it's not about shapes and plays and tactics too much anymore. It's about relentless pressure and and consistently getting over the advantage line and speeding up the play at different moments in the game and, and recognising when you've got the opposition on the back foot, recognising the, the speed of the ruck is about to speed up and having those players that can take advantage of it. You know, they've got it in the Queensland side. Uh, that's where they beat us in round one, game one. New South Wales got it right in game two and this is, I think, what they're looking to do in game three. 
you know, these, these will be two different styles. Of, Queensland will be desperate to get this Origin game back to looking what it looked like in game one. New South Wales, no, that's not the type of game they want to play uh, against Queensland. They want to play more the expansive game that was played in Origin 2 over there in Perth, and even though it was a little bit damp over there and they, they consistently moved the ball from the backfield, they got their back five behind the ball much earlier in the tackle count and, and gave themselves options to move the ball and not get bogged down, and, um, and they were attacking from further out. And I think that's, that's the game that New South Wales now knows it needs to play. It's just who can get it on first up there in Queensland. Um, I'm sure Queensland know what they need to do and I know New South Wales now know what they don't do. Um, both will have learned from games one and two and now it's the art to apply it in game three to the best of your advantage. Mm. Um, Aaron Jarman's asking if you think Jack White might sneak into 17 before kickoff. Well, I don't think there'll be changes to the 17 tactically or strategically. I don't think they'll be holding that back. Um, you know, only injury would do it. I know that Matt Burton um, is carrying a little calf strain, uh, and from all reports, he's not training today. But um, we informed Brad Fittler that he just had a little twinge after Origin. He played with it against the Bulldogs. It's not anything that held him back, but um, just said to Matt before he went into camp that you know the coach is well aware of it. Don't be afraid to yeah. put your hand up and pull out and rest it. You've got ten days to get ready. Um, to make sure that you're 100% for the game because young blokes will go in there and they won't say anything and they will, they'll be yeah. reluctant to pull out of a session, you know, for fear. But um, you know, I, I rang Brad person. I said, look, man, he's got a little little calf thing there. Just look after it and he'll be fine by game time. So, But other than that, um, no, I don't. I think that 17 will take the field and Jack White will play his role as the 18th player. Okay. Um, on the Queensland side, now we talked, I think, last week or the week before about Queensland's ability to pick players um, with little club experience and they aim up and they're going, going to try to replicate that with Tom Gilbert, who is a real tearaway. Like he's, uh, I spoke with Jonathan Thurston actually on radio this week and I said he only plays the game at, at one speed and his response was well, he only trains at one speed. He is just flat out from start to finish. So he gets an opportunity on the bench. Josh Papali'i, Gus, has only played 40 Eight minutes in two origins in two very short stints at the start. Mm. Is Father Time catching up with Josh? Father Time is undefeated, Matt. Mm. It's one of my favourite sayings. Father Time is undefeated. It gets us all. But they've backed him again here? Yeah, and they should do. He's a big time player. Yep. And, and I think you'll see a lot more minutes in this game. I can see him having a couple of, at least two really strong stints uh, in this game. Again, they've gone for a very mobile bench uh, with their forwards, and it's it's a working man's pack. This is all about what the game looks like when Harry Grant gets onto the field. This is what they will try to do is replicate the style of game that we saw in Sydney for Game One. That suits Queensland the best. You know, to get it into a little bit of a um, a cycle, get it into a kick chase cycle, go forward, kick chase tackle, go forward, kick chase tackle. You know, hold the scores close and then wait for, um, you know, Harry Grant to come in and break it up a little bit more and then for Munster and Ponga and these fellas to, to weave their magic. And they won't be looking at scoring a big score to win this game. They'll they'll place it more on defence and containing New South Wales and keeping New South Wales at their own end of the field. That's what they were able to do in game one. New South Wales played very little football on transition, very little football off kick reception, probably kept waiting for their set play situations or... Um, even Nathan Cleary said to me after the game too, he said, we're kind of just sort of waiting for it to happen. Well, you can't do that in origin because the other side's too good. They're too smart. Once they get the game they want, they just don't let you out of it. And they didn't let New South Wales out of it. Mm. Um, and Queensland were able to squeak out a narrow victory. Um, so it's it, that's the sort of game Queensland needs to do. It needs to dominate. It needs to dominate possession. It needs to dominate where New South Wales gets the ball in the early... So it gets the game into that grind. And once they can get the game into that grind, then when the scores are close, Queensland have just got this... They tend to play with a little bit more free spirit in big moments and, and have done for a long time, the, the Maroons. And you know, Munster is a perfect example of that and Harry Grant's a perfect example of that. There is nothing really complicated or strategic or tactical about what they do. It's just completely, you know looking at the opportunity and seizure pointing it straight away and then linking up as a group and um, and they can squeak out that try in in the second half that gets them in front and then they just they get up offside and they cheat from marker and do all the things that you're supposed to do in origin and and 
and they can squeak out a win. They, the Queensland can win. I don't think they will. I don't think New South Wales will be dragged back down into that type of game, game again. But the first 20 minutes is crucial. It's, it's really who establishes what sort of game it's going to be. Mm. If it becomes a fast, open, free game, New South Wales will win comfortably. If Queensland can somehow, and the weather is for fine weather, I don't know whether the track will be completely dry, but it's for fine weather leading into it, so I don't think we're going to have a wet surface. Um, and it's not going to be overly warm, so I can't see a lot of dew. Uh, I think it'll be a nice dry track, and that'll suit New South Wales down to the ground. Wouldn't mind a dry track in Sydney at the moment. There's no golf, there's no racing, there's no anything. There's no going out on the boat. Didn't you I get the arc I often here? wonder why I'm still here. What am I doing? What am I enjoying? You're going to enjoy. Full what am I doing? I just field phone calls all day, people asking for something. No one rings to give you anything, do they? People always ring to ask for something. That's what I find. So what am I doing here? Well, you're going to talk about four club games. That's getting a little bit deep, isn't it? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> It's Things I want to improve. If we don't see some sun soon, a bit of weather, and the golf courses don't open up soon, I'm going to. What did no. I might go to Mars. I saw some pictures from Mars from the yeah. thing the other night. Well, there wasn't much happening over there. Either. No, it's pretty quiet up in Mars. Yep. Although there's, there's, there might be a whole bunch of other people up there that we haven't quite discovered yet. They might all be underground. We don't know. Well, what if there was a whole civilization living under the dirt on Mars we didn't know about? How would you get to meet them? You have to dig a hole. Well, then you've got to land there first. Yeah. Can't just send down a... There. You can get to Mars. Can't oh, no, the moon, they, go, they fly to the moon, don't they? Yeah. Richard Branson's mob go up there. Yeah. Um, Couldn't think of a greater waste of money. I, I, I think you get, you get on well with all the, all the aliens up there. They taught your language. <laughs> oh, oh, Gus, what are you doing? Welcome. <laughs> we love rugby league. Well, they're regular listeners of the podcast. <laughs> They tune into 100% percent footy oh, every there Monday night. Be bulldo- Go the Bulldogs! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Thursday night. Um, speaking of uh, weird and wonderful supernatural occurrences, it's at the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. Uh, so Cronulla versus Melbourne. Now, the, Cronulla obviously have Talakai out, but Tracy comes in, and that's pretty much it. Melbourne, no Munster, no Harry Grant. Pappy's back in the starting team officially. Uh, Nick Meaney's going to play 5'8", and Brandon Smith's going to start at hooker. So, look, they're still a pretty formidable app. Oh, no Felice Cafusi either, by the way, who's uh, unfortunately got a family matter and is attending to that in the United States and won't be returning for Origin 3 either. So, three big guns out for Melbourne against the Sharks. Yeah, look, the only thing I'll say about the Storm is that they were so embarrassing in the first, you know, 60, 70 minutes of play last week against Manly, that there will be a reaction. The coach is not going to put up with that rubbish. And there will be a reaction, whether they've got their best players in or not. And I think everyone will be now put on notice about their place in the side and in the, even in the club. Um, he, he doesn't tolerate mediocrity at all. And we saw a fairly mediocre performance. Uh, I think we said here last week, I had a lot of faith in, in, in Des Hasler and that Manly side to, to beat the Storm. And, um, and they certainly... You know, they ran away to a very comfortable lead. I know the storm came back late, but that wasn't... I don't read too much into that. Um, the Sharks, steady Eddie, probably... Um, I, I think the Sharks will win this game, um, even though I think there'll be an improved intensity from the storm, but Sharks closer to, to full strength and the fact that Nico Hines comes back from camp to play in this game, um, I'm going to give them the edge at home at the Bermuda Triangle. But anything can happen there, Matt, at the Bermuda Triangle. Anything can happen. Mm. Anything can happen. Drop breadcrumbs between your car and the booth, mate, because you have to find your way back to your car. Something yeah. you get lost over there. That's where the aliens like to watch the game. You see, the people yeah. up in Mars like tuning in when it's a shark park. I told you. Just on the Melbourne performance last week, obviously they're extenuating circumstances and months are not being there as he is this week. Has uh, that got you worried, or is that an aberration from Melbourne? Uh, I don't think it's an aberration because I've seen signs of it at different times this year. It's not. What are you seeing signs of? I'm seeing signs of wear and tear. Yeah. Is what I'm seeing signs of. Yeah, mm. I just there. Now that can be brought on by back the fact that you know, look, there's no getting away from the fact that we've got, you know, two maybe three distinct divisions in this competition on talent, and we have had for a few seasons. You know, so they get to play in a lot of games where they get away with a lot of, mm. a lot of loose stuff, but they're just too talented for their opposition anyway, and sometimes that comes out in big moments where. They're probably not as hardened or as battle-hardened as what they've done previously. They're probably not as disciplined. They're probably not as patient 
as what they've done, you know, when the competition is close. This, this competition over the last couple of years, COVID effect and people living away from home and so many teams that were out of contention halfway through the year. Our top eight was known less than halfway through the season. Certainly, premiership chances were very thin on the ground. I just don't know that... Um, that's done the Melbourne Storm any favours. Uh, you know, I think there's a clear distinction now between them and the Panthers, and you know, and, and if anything, the Cowboys are probably rating as an equal premiership chance to to any chances I think the Storm have got. Only inexperience in big games might might beat them as compared to the Storm, but um, there's just a fraying around the edges of the Storm at the moment, and. You know, but they got they got the game's premier coach, and you know he'll pull them back into line. That's why I'm expecting a reaction tomorrow night, even though his his good players aren't playing. But um, yeah, but uh, look, Panthers are a clear standout. This competition's over if we just go on exposed form to date and what we anticipate between now and the end of the year, and the fact that they're going to have seven or eight players with Origin experience under their belt again this year, leading into finals football. That's that's where you win premierships, and there's there's no one in this competition that's going to match them at that stage of the year. Then you've sort of got Cowboys, Storm, and then you've got to drop back to the others who I don't think are in the race at all for a premiership. So if, if you were if you were going to match up Melbourne and North Queensland in a match, full strength, both teams, tomorrow, are you saying you'd tip North Queensland at the moment? No, I didn't say that. I said they're probably on equal footing. I think Melbourne would probably get them through experience in big match football if they take the right attitude and the right football into the game. Uh-huh. But at the moment, we're not seeing enough of that. I'm not seeing enough of the of the traditional hard-nosed Melbourne Storm quality. You know, they, they always had a pride in in their attention to detail and their execution. I'm not really seeing that. They're they're relying uh, at times, I think, just a little bit too much on talent and the fact that they're better than their opposition rather than um, you know the the more traditional Melbourne Storms that we've seen. It's it, you know, it's just a little thing that I see. Okay. Newcastle, I'm South pretty City. crazy, you know. I don't, I don't expect everyone to see what I see, or to agree with it, nor do I care. Newcastle South, so Gagai and Pong are in Origin, but Jaden Braley's back, the forgotten man of the competition. He's going to come off the bench. Yep. First game back from an Achilles, and uh, they also get Bradman Best back. Now Souths have got uh, a big reshuffle. Here's Campbell Graham's got a fa- facial fracture. Could be out for up to uh, eight weeks, they're saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cam Murray's on origin. Uh, Cook's on origin, so Havili's going to play at hooker. Jai Arrow is replaced by Jed Cartwright in the back row. Um, and Latrell's going to cap in the side. But they still do have Latrell. They still do have Cody Walker and Lachlan Ilias, which is uh, three of the four main players in their spine. Nick Arima on the bench. Blake Taft, Michael Cheek, and Davey Moali. So it's still a formidable side, but... Uh, Friday night footy from Newcastle, and the Knights played well against Canberra and lost that in the last minute and then got up last week. So they've shown signs that they're maybe turning things around a little bit. Yeah, the the obvious answer is that you expect South Sydney to win this, but there's been enough from South Sydney this season for me to, to want to see it again before I go tipping them with any confidence in any game against any opposition, to be honest. Uh, obviously Latrell's a factor, but as I said, he's second up this week. He's had a long layoff and he's had a, a run on a heavy track last weekend and, and just how he feel might well be heavy this week for all we know with the, with the weather the way it is. But, um, you know, had Newcastle had their, their, their rep player there, I think that um, they'd have been a very good chance of winning this. I'm not so sure that without Ponga they can amass the points that South Sydney might be able to accumulate here. Um, I'm going to go with Rabbit but very, very interested to see the quality of their performance. I want to, I want to see how hard-nosed they go about this or whether or not they just go out and play and add up the scores at the end of the game and see who's in front, which is, I think is the way they, they've played a lot of the season. They've kind of just gone out and then, oh, full-time, how are we, how are we going? Oh, we're behind. I don't know. It's just something not quite right there. Okay. They need to get a little bit more hard-nosed about their football minute-to-minute minute and play-to-play. Play. Speaking of hard-nosed... Para make the trip to Leichhardt Oval on Saturday night. James Tamo comes back for the West Tigers. Adam Dewey is into the starting team in the centres. And New South Wales under-19 origin rep Justin Matamua will make his debut off the bench. He played well, uh, front rower. Played well in that game we, we saw here on nine. Junior Polo out in origin. Maradona Corey to the front row.
Leichhardt Oval. Well, their recent form's been pretty dismal, hasn't it? Um, since the, the loss of their coach and in a couple of games since, there hasn't been a lot of um, quality, nor, um, how would you put it, um, togetherness in their performance. They seem to splinter and, uh, and get isolated pretty quickly. They need to pull themselves together to put in a team performance. This is, this is um, you know, they've got the talent to win games. Adam Dewey back for the for the side now. He's he's in the starting lineup in the centres, um, but they need their forwards need to work a lot harder than they've been working. The Eels, again, you know, up and down, crikey, they're like a roller coaster, aren't they? They're all over the place, and, and again, you'd anticipate a reaction from them. Campbell Gillard not going to Origin is certainly a help for them. Uh, it's hard to tip West Tigers beating anyone right at the moment, but mm. you know, not that it would shock me if I. If someone told me that the Tigers beat the Eels this week, I wouldn't be shocked. Wouldn't you? But I would, I would definitely be saying to Parramatta, well, what happened? Mm. Um, it's a game that Parramatta needs to win, and I probably expect them to win. I think Moses and Dylan Brown and Gutherson, Reed Marnie, I think they'll make it happen. Um, that quartet of playmakers, if everyone else does their job, they'll be too good for the West Tigers. Sunday footy. The Broncos are without the following. Kurt Capel, Selwyn Cobbo, Patrick Carrigan, Tom Flegler, who is actually 18th man for Queensland, so therefore can't play. Plus, tomorrow Martin has ribs. Corey Jensen has got a calf, so they're out. So that's a big, big group of players that are unavailable. Reynolds remains, and for the Dragons, they're only missing one player from the team that won last week, but it's a big one. It's Ben Hunt, who's in camp with Queensland. Yep. Well, the Dragons, are you know, they're grafting out their wins um, without doing anything spectacular. Uh, their first half against South Sydney a fortnight ago, ago was unbelievable, but then lost the second half 12-0. Like it was sort of like a bit of an aberration from South Sydney. They squeaked out a win 12-10 against the Raiders last week. They were flogged by the Cowboys the week before. Um, they were up and down. They got behind in the second half against the Bulldogs. They squeaked out a win against the Warriors. Um, they were beaten by the Titans. You know, so... In their position on the ladder, there's a, mm. there's still some questionable performances totally there. They, yeah. they, they're not really putting the Wesser size to the, to the sword, and then all of a sudden, in all of that, they got beat 42-6 by the Melbourne Storm, and and then you know 12-6 against the Raiders, and then 12-14-12 on Anzac Day against the the, the, the Roosters, and 21-16 against the Knights, and then they're beaten by South 24-12, and then they got Parramatta 48-14. Like they. they they keep getting these big losses, 36-12 against the Sharks. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they get these big losses against the better teams. They have these narrow wins against the lesser teams. And they find themselves in the eight. And they find themselves in the eight. And that's pretty much all you have to do in this competition at the moment. If you can just beat the ordinary ones around you, chances are that you'll, you'll play finals football. But you're eons away from, from matching the top sides in the competition. Um, but, you know, it's not too late. Dragons, you know, on the confidence of where they are in the ladder and the confidence that they're actually playing with a winning mentality and that they can put in good periods of defence when they want to and that Ben Hunt's given them plenty of field position and control, you know, they can get themselves into contests and they've got players who can, can get a try at a, a vital time to put them in front on the scoreboard. They're not a brilliant team by any stretch of the imagination and their form is not outstanding by any stretch of the imagination. They've been exposed by a couple of the good sides in the competition and they've, they've squeaked out narrow wins against average sides, but that's all you have to do in this comp at the moment. And they find the Broncos grossly understrengthed on this occasion and they're in a winning vein of form. Uh, ben Hunt's not going to be there, so young Jaden Sullivan comes into the number seven role. Now, Jaden is a specialist halfback whose only appearances have been first grade, have been off the bench playing dummy half on several occasions, but... Um, his form in lower grades as a halfback has been quite productive. Um, he's, he's got you know, line breaks and line break assists and try assists in his repertoire. And you know, I know it's a one-off, but he'll be looking forward to the opportunity to play seven in this game. It, it's a hard one. It's because, you know... Can you see that the coach would have just gone right, circled this game? Like, boys, we've got... Pretty much all of you, except for Ben here, we can go up to Suncorp and beat these blokes. They're missing six or seven blokes. Like, was this? Can you see this is a real target game for them? Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. It's it's one you know, like if you win, you feel as though you've got a bonus. I mean, it's a game that they probably, if both sides were at full strength, they probably wouldn't feel as though they were in, entitled to favouritism. Yeah. 
Um, and I don't even know who is favourite in this Brisbane. game. Brisbane are slight favourites despite all those people being out. Well, that says enough about the Dragons' form or how people rate them, doesn't it? Uh, look, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to go with Dragon. Dragon. I just think they're closer to full strength. But, you know, I don't know. That's that's a hard one. I, it's very interesting to see how they go. Because I'm not, I'm not totally convinced about them. But they're not hopeless either. All right. Only four games this weekend. But you'll see Thursday here on Nine Sharks Melbourne. Gus is tipping the Sharks. We'll see Knights Rabbitohs on Friday night. Gus is tipping Souths. Saturday night. Para, but it wouldn't fall over if the Tigers beat him, I would. Shark, rabbit, eel, dragon. Okay. Sunday footy from Suncorp Stadium. Shark, rabbit, eel, dragon. Then we're off to... I'm calling Shark v Storm and Knight v Rabbit. So am I. Are you? Yep. Well, it'll be wonderful. Won't it be? It'll be great. We should do it from Mars. And then we've got an Origin Decider uh, on uh, Wednesday, and we're going to come... We, we are so dedicated to all of our listeners, both here on Earth and in outer space, that we are going to come back on Thursday morning and record a Six Tackles with Gus origin wrap-up special right here. So we look forward to your company. After then, a night out at Gambaro's. Sharp be going there. Sharp be going there. Having a, having a little lunch after our, after our Six Tackles, actually. Uh, Uru, see you next week.